All right, well, welcome to storytelling. If you want to give me a wave, Galen, if there's any problems with the, the Zoom. OK. Um, I would like to begin today's program by acknowledging that we are gathered today on the homeland of the Salish Kellis Bay people at a place they named Timsumkli. Their example is the original stewards of this land guides our work today. Travelers Trust Connection is committed to respectfully sharing the history and contemporary culture of the indigenous people who lived and traveled through the ancient crossroads on this land. We learn from many indigenous artists, elders, and organizations. We invite you to learn from and support them as well. What a nice crowd in the room. I know we had about another 20 people on Zoom. This is lovely. Thanks all for coming out today. Um, thanks also to the people that make these programs possible, our members and donors. Um, you know who you are. We love you all. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out today to corporate sponsors like Missoula Power Equipment and to MCAT, Missoula's Community Media Resource, who provided a me media assistance grant to record Saturday storytelling each week this winter. And that camera also provides the video feed for our Zoom, so we certainly appreciate it. Um, thanks also to the folks joining us on Zoom who have made a donation at TravelersRust.org. We appreciate you. If you're on Zoom, um, it's helpful if you keep yourself muted and your video off during the presentation. Preserves everybody's bandwidth. If you have questions for our speaker, please type them in the chat box on Zoom. We'll monitor the chat for questions and for any technical difficulties you might have. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce today's speaker. Milo McLeod worked in cultural resource management for over 40 years. For 28 of these years, he managed the Lolo National Forest Heritage Resource Program, including ensuring compliance with the National Historic Preservation Act. He developed public outreach programs such as Passport in Time and conducted determinations of eligibility and listings for the National Register of Historic Places. Milo has worked closely with American Indian groups, specifically the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, as well as the Nez Perce tribe on issues specific to cultural resource management and traditional cultural properties. We are certainly excited to hear about some of the secrets that you uncovered <laughs> in these homestead cabins today. My own class. Well, thank you, Molly. Uh, one thing Molly said is I worked for the Lolo for 28 years as the Heritage Program Manager, but what you failed to say is I'd also worked for the Lolo for five years as a seasonal archeologist. And uh, I had the opportunity, or the displeasure, if you will, to be uh, one of the first archeologists in the US Forest Service. And uh, we were not uh, embraced necessarily with open arms. I can remember hearing many times on the district, the last thing we need is another blank ologist. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, I persevered and eventually got a permanent appointment and uh, did spend 28 years as a professional archeologist working for the Lolo. And the subject of today's talk is going to be on both the Hogback and the Morgan Case homesteads up Rock Creek. Many of you may be familiar with these properties, but uh, in 1993, as we were restoring the Hogback, we did a three-week archeological project at the Hogback Homestead and required, acquired a tremendous amount of cultural material. And uh, that fall, I gave a presentation at the Society of American Archeology span meetings in Great Falls. And after I retired, you know, the Hogback is such a wonderful pre-contact site. And I'd never really completed the formal report. I'd given a paper on it, but uh, half the people who heard my paper in 1994 were now dead, and the other half probably forgotten about it. So I went to uh, Sidney Bacon, who was my replacement, and asked if I could borrow all the artifacts and the notes and dutifully began pulling this together into a professional paper. And I'm pleased to say I'm uh, about three quarters of the way finished. 
uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, a friend of mine who had been a graduate, school, a graduate student in anthropology at U of M in the 80s uh, went on and had a career as an archaeologist in Pennsylvania. And he has since retired, but still active. And he was aware of what we had been doing with the Hogbeck and Morgan Case, restoring them to become cabin rentals, et cetera. And he was hosting a session at the Society of American Archaeology meetings in Portland last year. And the title of his symposium was Public Sites and Public Lands. And he called me and said, uh, asked if I would be willing to give a paper on uh, Hogback and Morgan Case, those both being uh, Forest Service properties available to the public. It seemed to fit right in with uh, the treatise of his symposium. And I agreed, and I said, well, you're in luck because I've just been working on uh, all the artifact analysis from the Hogback. So I did give this paper in Portland, and uh, that's basically what you're going to get today. However, at the Society of American Archaeology meetings, your time limit is 15 minutes, and they're very, very strict about that. And they have a timekeeper with a little bell and a stick, and they'll tell you when you're three minutes out, and at 15 minutes, that's it. So uh, I feel a little more at ease today, because I can, I'll be reading from my paper, but then I'll be interjecting uh, also bits and pieces that I didn't have time or wasn't necessarily appropriate at the SAA meetings in Portland last year. And uh, the title of this paper that I gave uh, at the SAA meetings was Surprising and Unintended Consequences of Managing Cultural Resources, Rehabilitation of Two Historical Homesteads, Granite County, Montana. Long-winded title, but nevertheless, uh, here goes. In 1979, the Lolo National Forest purchased 320 acres within the Rock Creek drainage of western Montana for its recreational and wildlife values. The Land and Water Conservation Fund funded the purchase. The acreage consisted of two patented 160-acre homestead claims, HSE 288 and 560, making a total of roughly 320 acres. Each homestead parcel retained its homestead dwelling, while the Morgan Case homestead possessed a barn, bunkhouse, machine shed, and foundations of a former woodshed and sauna. And uh, here you can see, if uh, you see Missoula, and both Hogback and Morgan Case are within a mile of each other, and uh, they lie up Rock Creek at about mile post 30 and 30.5 respectively. And we'll start with the hogback. Charles Gerhardt filed a homestead patent for his homestead in 1914. Gerhardt lived at one of the abandoned mining claims within his proposed claim while improving his uh, homestead. Improvements included a log barn, a log house, a chicken coop. He cleared the bench north of his building complex and dug irrigation ditches to divert water from Hogback Creek to water his crops, which included mostly root vegetables. He obtained title to his property in 1917. Gerhardt sold the property in 1923 to William Miller, who retained the property for six years until 1929, when he sold it to the adjacent landowner, John Myers. And here we see the hog back, and this is what it looked like in 1979. And uh, no doors, no windows. It was a grazing allotment at that time, and cows were using it as a loafing shed. Uh, this is the hog back 10 years later. It's deteriorated, the front porch has collapsed and it was in pretty tough shape. 
Next, the Morgan Case homestead, about a mile to the south, was originally settled by Agnes Annie Morgan, an African-American woman from Maryland. She traveled west after the Civil War and lived for a time at Fort Meade, South Dakota, where she worked as a servant in the household of a 7th Cavalry Lieutenant. She arrived in the mining town of Phillipsburg, Montana in the late 1880s. In about 1894, she partnered with Joseph Case, a white Civil War veteran from New Jersey, who she nursed back to health after he suffered a bout of fever. Together, they built a bunkhouse, made a living in Upper Rock Creek, farming and renting the bunkhouse in the summer to fishermen from the mining towns of Granite and Phillipsburg. Annie filed her application for the homestead patent in 1911, but the process of proving up was cut short by her death in 1914. After being denied survivor's rights to the parcel, Case then filed his own application to the same land in 1915. After years of negotiation, Case received title to his homestead in 1919 at 74 years of age. Case sold the homestead in 1924 to John Myers and his wife Olga. The Myers farmed a little, ran a successful cattle operation which included le leasing grazing rights from the adjacent federal land. Meyer supplemented his income by making illegal liquor. In 1929, they purchased the Hogback Homestead from William Miller, consolidating the two properties. Whoop. And here we have a picture of Annie Morgan, approximately in the 1890s. Uh, here's Jack Case in 1924, he's standing in the doorway. And if you look real closely, you can see he's wearing his Civil War kepi that, uh, where he served in the uh, New Jersey Volunteer Infantry. And these two gentlemen on the left and the right are the district ranger from the Bonita Ranger District and the assistant ranger. Uh, just checking on uh, Jack since he had received uh, title to his homestead. The Myers sold their property to William Schmidt in 1943. The Schmidt family lived in the homestead and constructed several new buildings, including a woodshed, blacksmith shop, sauna. They continued to raise cattle and run a so small sawmill. Whoop. Here's the Schmidt family. And, uh, incidentally, I might add that uh, in 1924, you see this building. This is Annie and Jack's house uh, to the left. And it doesn't show here in the photo, but there's an addition on the north side. And then in 1923, Myers put another addition on the south side of this house. So the Morgan Case Homestead is actually three buildings kind of cobbled together. In 1951, the Schmidt sold the property to Frank and Sarah Puyer. They continued operating the ranch under the management of an on-site caretaker until 1979, when they sold the property to the Lolo National Forest. After acquiring the property from Puyers, the Forest Service initially proposed burning the homestead buildings, which they believed to be a liability hazard. Prior to proceeding with their removal, the Forest Service needed to complete its Section, 1, Section 106 compliance responsibilities under the National Historic Preservation Act. The Lolo seasonal archaeologists documented the homestead remains to determine if they qualified as historically significant properties under the National Historic Preservation Act. During the field work, the archaeologists documented the architectural remains of the two homestead building complexes. Gerhardt's Hogback Homestead and the Morgan Case Homestead, as well as the historic mining property, roughly a quarter mile east of the Hogback Dwelling. While documenting the Hogback Dwelling, the archaeologists also noted pre-contact lithic material, that's chipped stone, eroding from channels in the access road 
and from rodent burrows within a cultivated field north of the dwelling. The University of Montana anthropology students working under contract to the Forest Service had recorded the pre-contact site in uh, 1974, previously during the wild and scenic river study for the Rock Creek drainage. I might add, although they, uh, the university had uh, recorded this site, the report for this site would, went to the lands office. Uh, as a seasonal archaeologist, our office was across the street in the old jailhouse at Fort Missoula, and we never knew this uh, report existed until well after we had again recorded the site in 1979. 1979, compliance with Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act was still relatively new to the Forest Service. Rather than undertake formal consultation with the Montana State Historic Preservation Office to resolve the eligibility of the two homesteads, a management decision was made to let the buildings molder. Okay, I remember having a discussion with the ranger and the resource assistant at uh, the Hogback in uh, it's probably August of 1979, right after we'd recorded this property. And they said how they were going to burn it uh, because it was a liability hazard and to kind of clean up the site, get some of this junk out of here. And uh, I was a GS5 seasonal archeologist at the time. I didn't have many stripes on my sleeve or bullets in my gun. But I said, well, you can do that, but you know, we're gonna have to discuss this with the Montana State Historic Preservation Office, and it will probably include the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, and no doubt we'll have to do a data recovery plan, and you could just see their eyes glaze over. <laughs> and I killed them with bureaucraties. <laughs> and that was a victory because they didn't burn the buildings and they, okay, we'll let them molder, which in itself is an adverse effect, but nevertheless, it bought 10 years. Okay, in 1989, a gold miner had filed a new mining claim on Hogback Creek above the Homestead Building Complex. In order to access his claim, he requested authorization from the Missoula District to improve the existing road and extend it beyond the homestead dwelling to reach his operation. Because the existing road transected the pre-contact site and came close to the homestead dwelling, road construction had the potential to adversely affect both properties. Archaeologists from the Lolo National Forest conducted additional survey, documentation, and test excavation of the homestead and the pre-contact site. Uh, this is the boundary of the pre-contact site. It's roughly a quarter to a third of a mile up Hogback Creek and includes both the lower and the upper terrace. And we didn't have a location, but basically he wanted to build his road right up through here to access his claim. And in order to test the site, see how big it was, and if it was indeed archeologically significant, we put in uh, seven one-by-one -one test units, one-by-one -one meters. You can see them located here. And each uh, test unit yielded uh, significant uh, pre-contact artifacts, including projectile points, knives, scrapers, and a variety of uh, lithic debitage. We also recorded two significant uh, peeled ponderosa pine. Here's the hogback homestead behind us, and uh, you can see this peeled pine. And there was another one uh, up on the hill uh, above the homestead. And in the spring of the year, the Indians would peel the bark back as it had a very high sugar content. And there are several of these located up and down Rock Creek. There's several of them located uh, along the Lolo Trail, uh, just west of here. And in fact, Lewis and Clark uh, mentioned in their journal that uh, 
they would have lost the trail except for the numbers of peeled pine which the Indians peel in the spring of the year. And uh, you can actually date these uh, peeled pine by taking an increment bore and boring in through the scar and then boring in through the bark and comparing it. And there are several of these peeled trees uh, on the Bitterroot National Forest at Indian Trees Campground uh, down near Sula. And in the 70s, they bored about 70 or about uh, 19 of these trees and recovered dates from as early as 1796, you know, 10 years before Lewis and Clark, all the way up through the 1870s and 1880s. And here are some of the uh, stone tools that we found, projectile points. In 1990, the uh, Missoula District decided to rehabilitate the Hogback Homestead and turn it into a cabin rental. And uh, this was relatively new that the Forest Service really hadn't been in the cabin rental business. It was a brand new program under the uh, recreation fee demo program. And the money generated from the uh, rental of the buildings would go back to the ranger district with the idea of conducting the maintenance and uh, maintaining the buildings. Okay, Missoula district personnel began removing trash from the site while photographing and documenting features saving key architectural elements such as window sash, beadboard, and porch flooring. Rehabilitation of the building began in 1990 under the direction of Jim Askins, a retired National Park Service exhibit specialist. Now exhibit specialist in this sense means a uh, person trained in restoring historic buildings. The building is actually the exhibit. And Askins uh, founded what was called the Williamsport Preservation Training Center. And they trained people to go out into the national parks and do work on historic buildings. And that includes everything from Mount Vernon, George Washington's home, to uh, forts in the west, to Monticello, um, these are the folks who do do the work on our premier historic object or buildings in uh, in our country. <clears throat> Askins proposed placing concrete jack pads at the four corners of the building prior to removing and replacing the section, the structure's rotted sill and wall logs. And because excavation would disturb the pre-contact deposit. The forest undertook a data recovery effort. Okay, here you see us uh, hewing the replacement logs. And uh, digging holes for the jack pads. And Gerhardt, when he built his house, little did he know that he built it right on top of a significant pre-contact archaeological site. So, as we were digging the holes for the uh, concrete jack pads, we had to screen all the material that came out. And again, we were recovering uh, extensive numbers of projectile points, knives, scrapers. And uh, for the sill log replacement, we put a grid on the uh, north and also the east wall and then excavated on the interior and uh, here you can see a screening and digging on the interior of the building. And these are some of the pre-contact uh, artifacts that we found. On the left are tools such as knives and scrapers. And on the right, uh, we have projectile points. Now the abundance of archaeological material recovered during this initial phase of site rehabilitation indicated that any ground disturbing activity associated with rehabilitating the homestead would require additional data recovery. 
Uh, aside from the uh, pre-contact artifacts, we also recovered a lot of artifacts associated with the homestead. And uh, here we have some children's toys, which is uh, part of a toy truck or wagon, a marble, uh, farming implements, cartridge cases, uh, bottles, uh, broken farm equipment. But uh, in 1993, we proposed using a passport and time project where we would recruit uh, people from the public to come assist with uh, the excavation of uh, the hogback to mitigate the uh, adverse effect of constructing or rehabilitating the building and uh, along with the road, the drain field, the parking areas. And we had 10 volunteers for three weeks working under the supervision of uh, professional archeologists. And we had volunteers come from Georgia, California, Montana, and Colorado. But uh, prior to uh, the Passport and Time Project, we initiated consultation with the Montana State Historic Preservation Office, as well as the Salish and Kootenai Culture Committee. The archaeologists proposed conducting a controlled excavation to mitigate the proposed development areas. And with the State Historic Preservation Office and tribal concurrence, um, the project was conducted between July and August in 1993. The archaeologists excavated 33 square meters to a depth of 20 to 30 centimeters each. This, here you can see uh, what we were, uh, did our excavation in four areas that were going to be impacted by construction. One is the parking area down here near the confluence with the Rock Creek Road. Another was uh, where we were going to put in a vault toilet. Uh, then the drain field, and then for road reconstruction. And with the State Historic Preservation Office, and okay, I've said that, the site yielded an abundance of cultural material dating from the Paleo Indian period 10,000 years ago through the historic period of 200 years ago. And here we see some of our uh, knives, scrapers, projectile points, and here we have ground stone. Uh, some of the other projectile points. These two are what are called Pelican Lake that date from about 3,500 years ago. And this is what's called a uh, Paleo-Indian projectile point. We called it a Folsom. It's the base. The uh, point has been broken off. But these date to about 10,000 years ago. And uh, it was the first Folsom point found west of the Continental Divide. Several have been found in eastern Montana. In fact, Helena has one of the most prolific uh, Folsom sites in Montana called the McAfee site. But uh, at the time, we contacted uh, Dr. Les Davis, <clears throat> who was uh, supposedly the expert on Paleo Indians in uh, Montana. And he said, well, it's not Folsom. It might be a mountain variant of Folsom, but it's definitely Paleo. And you can see this flute. And the corner notch, or the notch here, that's what uh, indicates that it would be paleo. Uh, we also uh, asked the uh, <clears throat> advice of uh, Dr. George Frizen, another uh, paleoanthropologist from uh, University of Wyoming. And Frizen is the one who suggested that it be a mountain variant, that they found similar type points uh, in the mountains of Wyoming, primarily the Wind River Range, but uh, not, it's not your classic Folsom, but it's definitely Paleo from approximately 10,000 years ago. The material type 
included chert, basalt, quartz, quartzite, and obsidian. One blue trade bead was recovered, indicating occupation from the proto-historic or early historic period, 1700 to 1850 AD. Also, the historic artifact assemblage consisted <clears throat> was consistent with items expected on an early 20th century homestead to include glass, nails, cartridge cases, and broken farm implements. Included among the uh, historic artifacts were a few children's toys. We know that uh, Charles Gerhardt was single and didn't have children. <clears throat> William Miller, <coughs> we've looked him up in the census, and he was there between 1926 and 1929. And the census is only on even years, which would be 1920 and 1930. We suspect Miller, who was married, had children, and the toys probably belonged to him. But yet we can't find him in the Granite County census mm -hmm. as of yet. Additional re data recovery were recurred during the monitoring for road construction and vault toilet installation in 1995. Several <clears throat> stone tools and a quartzite core were recovered in 95, as well as an intact fire hearth. Here's our fire hearth, and <clears throat> here's some of our uh, quartzite tools. And it was interesting, although we had done some excavation along uh, the road, when they did reconstruction, we knew that uh, it would uncover uh, some previously undisturbed areas. And out of all the one-by-one -one units we had excavated, we had never found a fire hearth. And we know there must, people had lived all over that bench, and there were fire hearths. And with a fire hearth, uh, you can obtain charcoal, and from that charcoal, you can get a radiocarbon date. And we were up walking in front and behind the road grader when it was uh, widening the road, and the blade on the road grader, <clears throat> uh, just directly behind us, cut a fire hearth right in half. It was like taking a knife and cutting a pie in half. And here's the hearth. <clears throat> and uh, we quickly uh, stopped the grater and excavated the fire hearth. And we got a radiocarbon date of 1520 AD, not nearly as early as uh, what we expected. But from the projectile points, this site was occupied from 10,000 years ago all the way up through the historic period. So 1520 is consistent with the late prehistoric period. OK, uh, <clears throat> let's move forward to 2014. I retired in 2008. And when I retired, I formed this little group called uh, the Friends of Upper Rock Creek. And we had a uh, challenge cost share agreement with the Lolo National Forest to do some of the maintenance and uh, preservation work at both Hogback, Morgan Case, and Rock Creek Cabin, which is a Forest Service facility about a mile away. And my thinking was, these sites, these buildings are so unique and so special the district didn't have the time and money to maintain them to the standards that we thought they should be maintained to. Hence, we formed the Friends of Upper Rock Creek. And what I did was just contact previous people who had helped restore both the Hogback and Morgan case through Passport and Time program and said, uh, hey, do you want to come and spend a week up at Hogback or Morgan case? We're going to be re-roofing the spring house at Rock Creek Cabin. We're gonna be restoring the garage at Morgan Case. Uh, later on, we reconstructed a historic barn. But 2008, I started a group called the Friends of Rock Creek. As I say, we operate under a challenge cost share with uh, the Lolo National Forest. And about a year or two after I started, 
friend of mine contacted me and said, uh, Milo, do you need any money for that work you do up Rock Creek? And I said, well, yeah, we could always use some money. Because what we would do, uh, we had a cook, and people would donate or give $50 a week so the cook could buy groceries. But, you know, we were operating on a shoestring, and it was all a volunteer effort. And I uh, said, sure, we can use some money. And he said, well, how much do you need? And I said, well, how about $5,000? He said, well, I don't like to deal in small change. How about twenty-five? <laughs> well, sure. <laughs> and uh, you know, that bought some pretty good food for the uh, volunteers. <laughs> but it also allowed us to buy new wood stoves for the hogback, a new wood stove for Morgan Case Homestead, a new wood stove for the bunkhouse at Morgan Case, we contracted to get electrical work done at the bunkhouse at Morgan Case, a telephone installed. We've also done weed abatement along the Rock Creek Road. And every year, we get a stipend from <clears throat> the Harry Willett Foundation. I might add, uh, the Harry Willett Foundation is run by a fellow named Ryan Willett. <clears throat> and he and I work together on the Lolo as young archaeologists in, from 75 to about 78. And Ryan had always had a very fond appreciation for Rock Creek. And he heard what we were doing, and he jumped at the chance to help fund us. So put in a plug for the Willett Foundation. OK. Uh, a long soliloquy about the Friends of Upper Rock Creek. But in 2014, archaeologists and volunteers from the Friends Group excavated seven one-by-one -one units to mitigate the placement of large stones for a parking barrier at the Hogback. And uh, Al Hilshey, who was the resource assistant at the Hogback at the time, felt that uh, people were driving on the grass through here in the winter or in the summer, and it was killing the grass. So he wanted to install these uh, big parking barrier stones. And the friends helped finance that. But we said, look, this is a premier prehistoric archaeological site. We're going to have to do excavation and screening of the material where the stones go. So we did uh, with our friends group. Uh, my wife, Janine Kaywood, is also a professional archaeologist. And we essentially ran the uh, excavation for mitigation for the stones for about two weeks. And artifacts from the pre-contact component, oh, let's see. In 2014, the data recovery produced four late period projectile point fragments, two middle period projectile point fragments, two ground stone artifacts, several small bone fragments of chert, basalt, obsidian, and quartzite. Artifacts from the pre-contact component at the hogback site demonstrate that people occupied the area peri periodically from the Paleo-Indian period 10,000 BP through the late prehistoric and historic periods, 1700 to 1850. Chert, cryptocrystalline silicates from the hogback could have been acquired from quarries in Granite County, including the Eyebrow and Mount Baldy. And quarries approximately 25 miles northeast and north, respectively. The nearest obsidian source, however, is Bear Gulch, <clears throat> approximately 150 miles southeast in the Centennial Valley of Idaho. Obsidian samples from the Hogback site demonstrate that eight came from Bear Gulch. Four samples originated from Timber Butte near Boise, Idaho. And two samples came from Teton Pass, Wyoming. Obsidian artifacts occur at other sites in the Flint Creek Valley, such as Graybeal and Fred Burr number one. 
The Black Bear Coulee site is located approximately 20, 20 miles north of the Flint Creek Valley. An obsidian from Black Bear Coulee appears to exclusively come from Bear Gulch, while obsidian from Fred Burr shows three samples from Bear Gulch and one from Timber Butte. Shows five obsidian samples originating from Timber Butte at sites in the Flint Creek Valley. No other sites in the valley contain samples from Teton Pass. The occurrence of multiple sources of obsidian at the Hogback site indicate a long history of intercultural contact or trade with other people to the south and east. The Hogback site lies within the traditional homeland of the Salish and Kootenai. Although Numic speakers from the Great Basin, Shoshone, pushed into southwest Montana regularly during the last 9,000 years, the classic Numic spread of 1,500 to 1,000 years ago was the most recent which is visible in the archaeological record. Unfortunately, the hogback site lights, lacks a defined stratigraphy due to the thin soil layers and the displacement of cultural material through natural processes such as frost heaving. Consequently, relatively dating techniques based upon projectile point type typology provide the only reliable dating technique. Missoula District staff, assisted by passport and time volunteers, completed the rehabilitation of the Hogback Homestead in August 95. A month later, the homestead entered the Region 1 cabin rental program. An interpretive sign located adjacent to the Rock Creek Road provides information on Native American use of the area and the later homestead era for renters and the general public. Almost immediately, the Hogback Homestead become, became one of the most popular cabin rentals within the northern region of the U.S. Forest Service. Now, let's move on to Morgan Case. In 1999, the public appreciation and support for the Hogback Rental Program, along with financial contributions from historical research associates, prompted the Missoula District to rehabilitate the Morgan Case Homestead. Jim Askins, National Park Service retired, initially believed the Morgan Case property unworthy of rehabilitation due to the multiple periods of additions to the building. However, Askins was unaware of the unique history of the homestead relating to Annie Morgan and Joseph Case, the original occupants of the site. A major cleanup and interior deconstruction began with volunteers from HRA and Gray and Pape under direction of Lolo National Forest personnel. The following year, Passport and Time volunteers under forest supervision continued the effort. A new concrete foundation and sill and wall logs Replacement began in 2001. The work was completed by contract, the Region 1 Historic Preservation Team, and Missoula District personnel. Passport and Time volunteers installed a new cedar shingle roof in 2003. The following year, the Morgan Case Homestead was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Reconstruction and rehabilitation efforts continued in 2006 with Missoula District personnel and pit volunteers completing a stone retaining wall, a perimeter fence, entrance gate, and restoring the root cellar. Here we are restoring the root cellar and interior work. Interesting about the root cellar, which is right here, which is directly across the road from Morgan Case, and you really have to look for it. I mean, it, people miss it all the time. But as we uncovered the roof and all the pine needles and dirt, there was big pieces of metal put on to uh, keep the dirt out. And uh, we had everything from discs to old stove parts to a 1934 Butte license plate, <laughs> which was pretty cool. And uh, this woman, Fern Freeman, uh, she was with us on two of our work sessions. She was 83 years old. And 
spent her summers going from Passport and Time Project to Pit Project. She had a little scamp trailer and she would stop at the local library and check her email and see where the next project was. It might be in Montana, it might be in Wisconsin, it might be in Louisiana. But she was all over the country at 83. Certain projects such as installing an electrical system and interior drywall installation and taping were contracted to certified and bonded contractors. In 2007, Passport and Time volunteers installed an interior hardwood floor as well as rebuilt windows and screens. A component of the work included widening the west side doorway to make it meet accessibility standards. During the dismantling of the existing door frame, Kirby Matthew, director of the Region 1 Historic Preservation Team, discovered a cache of unique historic artifacts purposely hidden in the door jam. The artifacts included a hand-carved wooden spatula, several bundles of string, a red silk soap wrapper, a receipt from a Phillipsburg grocery store with Annie Morgan's name, all contained within a hand-sewn muslin bag. Matthew, a graduate of the National Park Service Historic Preservation Training Center with a background of anthropology, immediately recognized the importance of the artifacts. Shortly thereafter, shortly after the discovery of the artifact bundle, C. Riley Auger, a doctoral candidate at the University of Montana, specializing in archaeology of magic, heard of the find and requested to study the collection. Dr. Auger knew of Morgan's reputation as a healer, and after studying the bag and its contents, concluded that Annie probably drew on Afro-American hoodoo, healing methods. This method is based on the spiritual tradition of enslaved Africans brought to the Americas during the slave trade. These West and Central African belief systems mixed with Christianity resulted in hoodoo. The character of the artifacts indicate that Annie practiced root doctoring hoodoo rather than conjuring hoodoo. Root doctoring hoodoo focused on healing, whereas conjurers hoodoo controlled spirits to inflict injury or harm. Root doctoring hoodoo used plant parts and roots as well as charms and rituals to summon spirits to help heal the patient. Traditionally, healers placed charms in dark places near the entrance to their homes to inform the spirits about the powers of the healing process. They also serve as a warning or barrier to keep unfriendly spirits out. Annie's root doctoring bag contained the tools needed for her practice. The carved wooden spatula would crush and mix plant material for medicine, while the string helped in binding and mending wounds. The brilliant red and blue soap wrapper Red the color of blood and blue the color of water was considered an important boundary between the spirit and living worlds. The receipt with Annie's name is important because in hoodoo, someone's written name is equal to the person being physically present and identifies them to the spirits. Additional African magical assemblages similar to Annie's have been found at sites in the south and east. However, this is the first to appear in the Pacific Northwest. The discovery of Morgan's root hoodoo bundle and its interpretation by Auger contributed another important layer of significance to the Morgan case homestead. Since then, Annie Morgan has been inducted into the Montana Cowboy Hall of Fame in 2013. She also warranted a chapter <clears throat> in the book Bold Women in Montana History by Beth Judy. Rehabilitating the Morgan Case homestead took nine years and required the efforts and funding from a variety of sources, both within and outside the Forest Service. Personnel from the Region 1 Historic Preservation Team, the Missoula Ranger District, numerous passport and time volunteers completed the project in May 2008. Morgan Case Homestead entered the cabin rental program in 2008 and quickly overshadowed the hogback 
as one of the most popular rental programs in the northern region. In conclusion, when the Forest Service purchased the Puya Ranch in 1979, their intention was to remove all evidence of the homestead improvements and restore the area for its traditional values, such as fishing and hunting, in open space. While the land <coughs> is indeed used for these uh, pursuits, it is also valued for its cultural sites. The Hogback and Morgan Case homestead dwellings both rehabilitated for use as a cabin rental, now act as a type of living history, giving renters a feel for homestead life in the late 19th century. The use of these two properties also preserves the significant pre-contact site underlying Hogback Homestead, which has contributed significant information regarding the pre-contact oc occupation of Upper Rock Creek. Complete Unexpectedly, the Morgan Case homestead also yield evidences of Annie Morgan's cultural tradition of root doctoring and hoodoo healing. In the future, when an agency or other landholding entities acquires new property for whatever reason, recreation, wildlife, open space, do not underestimate or overlook the value it may hold. You may be very surprised. Before I finish, I would like to put in a plug for Beth Judy's book, Bold Women in Montana History. She uh, <clears throat> discusses the biography of 11 different Montana women, uh, a lot of Native American as well as Anglo, and uh, Annie Morgan. <clears throat> and she did a tremendous job <clears throat> researching the history of Annie Morgan from Baltimore to Fort Meade, South Dakota, to Phillipsburg, and finally Upper Rock Creek. And between she and Riley Auger uh, getting into the hoodoo and root doctoring, I mean, it really blew my mind. So, any questions? Yes, sir, Homer. Oh, I'm gonna take a second here. I wanna make sure you saw that we got you this. And oh, thank if, you. Milo, when people ask a question in the room, if you can repeat it, so the folks on Zoom can hear the question. Okay, let me take a drink of water first. I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, I, think I had the pleasure of working with Milo when I worked with the recreation program on the Lolo National Forest. <clears throat> Milo was an inspiration to all of us because he had a very limited budget. He had a very limited travel budget. <clears throat> the Lolo Forest, of course, goes from Lolo Pass, Lookout Pass, Thompson Falls all the way to the continent about east of uh, Seabee Lake. So uh, if you live in Missoula, you're on the road a while. And he had uh, seasonal employees he had to keep enough money for. So most of the time they would take a tent, walk tent, camp out to keep all that travel time down, to focus on the job at hand, and uh, he cook a lot of the meals right there. <laughs> so in addition to the Rock Creek area, he worked with the whole forest. It was always interesting to talk to him because he had a new story about things they found. But anyway, he's a good example for the rest of us to try to limit the money you spent. Never stay in a motel unless you just have to. <laughs> Never eat a restaurant if you can cook your own meal. But anyway. Well, thank you, Homer. <laughs> Yes, Jack. Weren't there some big old water roofs of vines on that uh, Morgan Case site? Oh, yeah. Did you ever bore them? We haven't. Um, Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Okay. Uh, Jack Puckett asked, uh, aren't there some big ponderosa pines at Morgan Case? And <clears throat> yes, indeed there are. And many of them have also been scarred. He asked if we had bored them. And uh, I tried boring one in 1979, and these are old growth, and I got the increment bore in there, and it was very difficult. I finally got it out, and as soon as I got it out, it was under so much pressure, the core just exploded as soon as it hit the air. 
So that was my only attempt at boring the trees. I will add, um, with consultation with the tribes, the Salish and Kootenai, they view these peeled trees as almost sacred sites as done by the ancestors, and they have a certain amount of reluctance to uh, intrusive investigations, i.e. boring. But maybe those attitudes can change. When they did uh, board the trees at Indian Trees Campground on the Bitterroot, I don't think they ever talked to the Indians. But if you talk to them now, they have some reservations about boring the uh, culturally modified trees. Yeah, Joe. Milo, I remember the asbestos abatement that went on in Borden Case at uh, the original cabin ceiling, I think it was over the kitchen area. This random fact I remember is that the abatement company said the asbestos came from Africa. Is that true? Did you hear that? Uh, the question was, and this is from Joe Kippett, who was involved in uh, both the ho Hogback and Morgan Kay's homesteads, that uh, when we started on Morgan Case, that the kitchen had a lot of asbestos in the ceiling, and he had heard that it came from Africa, and I wasn't aware of that. Uh, what we assumed is one of the Schmitz, they were originally from Butte and Anaconda, is they worked for the Anaconda Company at some time and pilfered the asbestos for insulation from the company. Charles Gerhardt, the first homesteader at the Hogback, he would work on the homestead during the summer months and then during the winter he'd go back to Butte and work in the mines. And we found several things, including the road roofing, that we thought had been pilfered from the Anaconda Company. We don't know, but it's a guess. Yes, ma'am. So my question is, regarding many of the artifacts that were found, like the arrowheads and the scrapers, so it sounds like a lot of that material is not local that they were made out of. Is that correct, or were some... Oh, uh, the, obsidian, the obsidian came from elsewhere. Uh, the chert, there are some chert quarries nearby, uh, basically uh, just a little west of Hall, uh, and then in the John Long Mountains. Uh, basalt could come from almost anywhere, river gravels. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that obsidian traveled a long ways. In fact, uh, on another note, Obsidian was so highly valued that obsidian from Obsidian Cliff in Yellowstone has been found as far east as Cahokia in St. Louis. I mean, during Cahokia, they'd actually send boats up the Missouri River to go to Yellowstone to mine obsidian. And it's been found at the Dells, <clears throat> which is a big trading center for people in the plateau. So, yeah, Yellowstone Obsidian and some of these other quarries can travel a long ways. But the chert and the quartz was also not necessarily local? Quartzite uh, can be local, chert can be local, basalt. Thank you. Uh, sort of a follow-up on that question. Somebody on Zoom would like to know, how do you know where the obsidian is from? Or um, what's the process for identifying the different quarries? Okay, it's called obsidian hydration. Each quarry has a very different signature in its molecular structure. I don't really know how it works, but we send samples to a fellow named Richard Hughes in California, and he's kind of the guru on obsidian. He's been doing this for over 40 years and uh, can source many, many different quarries in the West. But it's interesting, whereas we have obsidian from Timber Butte, uh, Bear Gulch, uh, all these other quarries, we don't have any from Obsidian Cliff in Yellowstone, which is kind of remarkable. There are a couple more questions on Zoom. Does anybody else in the room have a question for Milo? Yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, is there any other work that you 
that needs to be done on Kevin, or that you want to have done, or are you kind of in the maintenance? Uh, the question was, is there any other work? <clears throat> uh, I assume you're referring to the pre-contact archaeology. Is that right? No, I'm talking about the cabinet. Oh, uh, we're pretty much in a maintenance mode now. Uh, one of the things we have to do at Morgan Case, and we hope to start this spring, is uh, we re-roofed Morgan Case in 2003. And we used galvanized roofing as flashing in the valleys. <clears throat> and because of those big ponderosa pines, the needles collect in the valleys and they have a very high acid content. And the acid is eating through the flashing. So <clears throat> this spring, we hope to go up and remove the flashing, replace it with copper and then uh, repair the roof. And we've got, I think, five or six different valleys. So it's gonna be a sizable job. What about, you mentioned the pre-contact sites. Are you wanting to do more excavations or anything? Um, there's really no reason to. Uh, we have lots of information on the pre-contact site. As I say, we did uh, excavation in 2014 because we were gonna put the rocks in and that was going to disturb the site. So we went in and we excavated. But unless there's some, some reason that something's going to be damaged, we'll just leave it as it is. And uh, as archeologists say, you put it in the bank. Uh, techniques and technology will change in the future and you can learn a whole lot more. You don't want to excavate a complete 100% of a site. You want to leave some for the future. So another one of the questions from Zoom is about the mining claim up Hogback Road. Yeah. Um, did that, did the richness of the archaeological site have an impact on their ability to work that claim? And did the mine, the person who owned the claim, have to pay for any of that road work? <laughs> uh, the question was, uh, with the mining claim up the Hogback, did uh, the miner have to pay for any of that road work. Well, the road was never built. Because the site was indeed his, uh, culturally significant, and if he was to build a road in there, he would have had to fund what we call mitigation, or the data recovery of the archeological resource. And that would have been prohibitively expensive, and as far as I know, he just went away into the night. <laughs> But if you go uh, maybe a quarter to half a mile up Hogback Creek, there's, I told you, there was a mining claim there early on in the 1890s. There's extensive hand-laid rock and flumes and ditches. It's pretty impressive. Unfortunately, the mining cabins where Gerhardt lived when he was building the Hogback uh, were consumed by wildfire in 2017. We've got photos of them, but the cabins are now gone. Um, I also wanted to note that uh, there's a reference in the Zoom chat for folks in the room to a book called Annie by Lenore, is it Puhak? Am I getting that right? Um, McKelvey. Well, what's the last name? Is there? Yeah, Lenore McKelvey. Oh, sorry. Who uh, had of Helena. So the author is Lenore McKelvey, who had from Helena. The book is called Annie, and it is uh, more about uh, the cat in the woods, I guess, is what the uh, My only comment about that is it's more of a historical novel. Um, an individual's Perception of what could have happened. It's a ghost story. I mean, it, I'll leave it at that. So we'll say that's Judy's book for fact, and this one may be for fiction. Exactly. Okay. Good to Beth, Judy for fact, <clears throat> and Ms. Lenore for fiction. Okay. Uh, one more question back here. You know, on the Morgan Chase, was there any <coughs> pre contact? Uh, findings there, or, or, or did you do any diggings at uh, Morgan Chase? 
Um, the question was, was there a pre-contact site at Morgan Case? There are several uh, culturally modified trees at Morgan Case. And Morgan Case is this big meadow adjacent to Rock Creek. And when we first acquired it, I thought, geez, this must be a great place for a pre-contact site. Teepee rings. So I flew with the Air Patrol uh, one day and took my camera. And we could see these rings out in the meadow. And I thought, ah, we've got teepee rings at the Morgan Case site. Well, turned to find out they were actually natural and there was a certain type of mushroom that grows in a ring. <laughs> so, teepee rings not. But we have found the occasional isolated uh, artifact, uh, piece of chert. We, not to say there's not a major pre-contact site, at Morgan Case, there may be, but we just haven't come across it yet. And what I find with the Hogback is it's an ideal site location because it's the confluence of Hogback Creek and Rock Creek, and there's the lower terrace and there's the upper terrace. <clears throat> and one thing I've noticed about archeological sites in Western Montana so you don't want to camp right next to the river because it gets cold at night. If you elevate yourself even six, eight, ten feet above the water, it's much warmer at night. So. Any more questions? Thank you so much. Mike. Okay, well thank you. And I just wanted to say thanks again to all of you for being here today, for folks who joined us on Zoom. We'll be back next week with Lucy Vanderberg, um, who is an elder of the Salish tribe. And she'll be talking to us a little bit about preserving the culture into the future. So that's very exciting. Um, in two weeks, on February 24th, we've had a change from our original schedule. In two weeks, we are going to have the filmmakers um, uh, a film called Bring Them Home, which is debuting at the Big Sky Documentary Film Festival. It is uh, created by a filmmaker and some Blackfeet filmmakers, and it is about the return of the bison to the Blackfeet territory. Um, and we're really fortunate to have this partnership with the Big Sky Documentary Film Festival, so a plug for them as well. Um, so you'll get to meet the filmmakers and see some snippets from the film itself on the 24th here. And then our final program for the series is on March 2nd. Christopher Preston will be here. He will be talking about his book, Tenacious Beasts, um, which is a lot about um, uh, species like the bison that have faced challenges and are recovering now um, thanks to the work in conservation that's being done in Montana. So I hope you'll I'll see you all for the next three weeks into March. Thanks again and have a great day.